Hello everyone and welcome to One Civil Law, where we learn through the misfortunes of others. As always, I hope you enjoy this legal education content and today may be the day that I earn your subscription. For today's case, we, we have a fun one because of the horror. This is the case of Mark Janey versus John Gamas. In this case, Mark Janey is a parolee and his parole officer forces him to go to a religious mission and attend religious services and read the Bible and pray and stuff. So you got a government official forcing someone to church. Hmm, I, I don't know. Is that okay? The government forcing someone to go to church? I don't know, I can't really think of any statutes or constitutional provisions that have anything to do with this. Hmm, let's get started with this. In early December of 2014, Mark Janney began 24 months of parole with the Colorado Department of Corrections. His assigned parole officer was John Games. On February the 3rd, Janney's friend drove Janney to a meeting with the officer at Fort Collins Parole Office. As a standard condition of parole, Janney was required to establish a residence of record where he would remain each night. Having been kicked out of his parents' house, Janey proposed the home of his friend in Loveland who had consented to hosting Janie while on parole. The officer rejected this residence because he believed Janie's friend was involved in illegal dr drug use. So, you know, fair enough. Uh, you can't stay with your friend. All right. So at the February 3rd meeting, instead of the friend, the officer, the parole officer, issued a written parole directive for Janie to establish his residence at the Fort Collins Rescue Mission as his residence of record. So he has to stay and sleep at the Fort Collins Rescue Minute, and he has to abide by all the house rules as established. The director stipulated that violation of these rules will lead Janney being placed in a Washington County jail to address the violation. There was no discussion of what was meant by house rules. Uh-huh. The officer explained that he was friends with Jim, Jim Carmack, the mission's director, and the two of them have arranged for Janney's stay at the mission. The officer told Janie he was to stay there until Games could reinstate the parole revocation complaint and bring him before the parole board. Mr. Janie objected to staying at the mission. Janie and Gomez signed a directive establishing the mission as Janie's residence of record. Games, the officer Games gave Janie an electronic monitoring device and scheduled a follow-up for the next day. Officer Games ended the meeting by telling him to report to the mission immediately where staff would be experienced inspecting him. Okay, so in order to determine whether the mission is an appropriate place for the, for the parole officer, who is absolutely a government official, to forcibly send someone, we need to know a little bit more about the mission. What, maybe it's just kind of a mission in name only. Maybe this is totally cool. Maybe this is an appropriate place to send a parolee. So can the government forcibly send him to the mission. Well, let's find out a little bit more about what happens at the mission to determine if this is an appropriate place. The mission is a Christian community center that provides transitional programs, emergency services, and meal services, and agency refers for referrals. Its motto is changing lives in the name of Christ. Hmm. Among the tr transitional programs the mission offered in February 2015 was Steps to Success, which the parties simply refer to as the program. The Steps to Success is a three to 10 month transitional Christian-based program that provides men and women help to become productive, self-sufficient citizens and exposes participants to the good news of Jesus Christ in a supportive community. Mm -hmm. Participants are required to attend a daily morning prayer service and a daily 5 p.m. service in the Mission Chapel in addition to an outside church service each Sunday and several sessions of evening Bible reading per month. They are also required to observe dorm-style rules, including set mealtimes and curfews and refrain from drug and alcohol. So, yeah, the, the mission isn't really so much a mission in name only as it is a blatantly religious enterprise with, you know, forced prayer times and forced church service attendance and you know, the, the, the forced Bible readings, kind of thinking, kind of thinking there might be some entanglement with religion here that might not be fully appropriate. Kind of thinking this could be a problem. Yeah. 
Upon his arrival at the mission, Jamie met with Carmack and Constancy, the mission's assistant director. The two mission officials told Jamie he was enrolled in the program and oriented him to house rules. They informed Jannie he was required to attend daily morning prayer and evening chapel, twice weekly Bible study, and outside church services on Sunday, and would also be expected to participate in one-on-one religious counseling. Mm-hmm. Carmack further indicated that he was good friends with Games, who was Carmack's former parole officer. So apparently, uh, Carmack used to be a parolee of Officer Games, and I guess they formed a relationship, a friendship, and now uh, the, he wants to help others. So, okay. Carmack explained to Janie that thus far, the program had only accepted female parolees, but we're going to give you a shot as the first male parolee as a favor to the officer. Okay. Janie explained to Carmack and Kaczynski that he's an atheist and he didn't want to participate in any religious programming. Carmack told Janney not to express those beliefs while in the program or tell anyone he's an atheist. Hmm. There's some, some, some restraints on speech there. Hmm. Carmack informed Janney that regardless of Janney's belief, Janney would participate in the mission's religious programming or get kicked out. When Janney protested, stating this was a violation of his religious rights, Carmack told him he had no religious rights while in the mission. Uh, uh, I, I think, I think you have religious rights everywhere. I, I think you have religious rights all the places. Y y yeah, uh, uh, yeah. When Janie, pr yeah, okay. Carmack and Constanti warned Janie that he must stay at the mission and comply with the program's rules, including religious ones, or put in jail. Janie responded with, that's not how the United States work works as religious freedom is the first precept of the nation. Janie is correct. Good on you, Janie. While Janie, with Janie and Kontansky present, Carmack then called Officer Games to tell him that Janie, as an atheist, was unfit for the program's religious component. Officer Games rest assured Carmack that Janie would follow the program's rules, including its religious rules, or go to jail. Go to jail or engage in religion. Mm. Officer Games over the phone and Carmack in person then both told Janie that regardless of religious reservation, he was going to stay in the program or be sent to jail. That is, the rules of the program, including religious rules, were rules of his parole. So, yeah, the, the government the government has said, as a condition of your parole, you must engage in the program and the, the steps and the prayer and the Bible reading and the outside church attendance and anything else. The government is mandating this. Okay, you know, that's, I seem to vaguely recall in the back of my head, I think I once read somewhere in federal law, can't quite put my finger on it, but I seem to recall somewhere in federal law that implied that government forcing religion on someone is a problem. Does anyone, anyone remember that? Anyone remember where that is? I, I can't. Can't quite put my finger on it right now. Carmack requested a meeting at Games' office to discuss the situation further. At this meeting, Officer Games, Carmack, and Janie discussed the program's religious requirements. So they're all meeting now in the parole office and having a discussion. Discussed the program's religious requirements, including Bible study, morning prayer, and daily chapel. When Janie again objected to these activities as an affront to his atheist beliefs, Officer Games responded, It doesn't matter. You're going to follow the rules of the program or you're going to jail. Over the next several days, Janie was forced to attend two Christian Bible studies at the mission. On February 5th or 6th, Carmack summoned Janie to his office for the religious counseling. Janie made it clear he didn't want to talk about religion, yet Carmack proceeded to discuss theological theories of existence and the history of the Bible. Carmack also challenged... Janie's belief, attempting to convert him to Christianity by means of Pascal's wager. Fun. Janie objected to his mandated daily attendance at the morning prayer and evening chapel, and he skipped several of the services. At one point, 
Contassi asked Janie if the place was growing on him. Is it growing on you? Which two? Janie responded, no. I'm still just as much a prisoner here as ever. <laughs> on the morning of February 8th, a Sunday, Carmack tore Janie aside and told him if he broke any more of the program rules, he'd be kicked out of the mission. At around 4.30 p.m., Janie told Carmack he had skipped the morning service and wouldn't not be going to the chapel either. At that point, Carmack said to Janie, you can't be here anymore. You have to leave because we're not doing what you tell that you to do. Janie packed his belongings, departed the mission, and stayed that night at his friend's house in Loveland. Janie's electronic monitoring device registered his departure from the mission. Therefore, the parole officer issued an alert that Janie was a potential escapee who had absconded from the shelter without authorization. An officer Games' request an arrest warrant was issued for Janie. An arrest warrant that's being predicated on him not being forcibly attending religious-based services. The next morning, Janie's friend helped him look for a suitable treatment center as which to establish a re residence of record. That's a nice friend. It's like, you know, I know you can't stay here, so I'll help you find somewhere else. When the attempt failed, however, Janie reported to his parole officer that afternoon. He was then arrested and taken into custody. On March the 10th, parole board found Janie had violated his parole by failing to remain oversight as a residence of record. Great parole board over here. The board revoked his parole and remanded Janie to custody for 150 days. I'm laughing because of the horror. I'm apparently, apparently the parole board also has not heard of that obscure federal law that deals with religion and people, you know, having freedom to it. That hasn't, hasn't heard that, it, that vague provision of federal law, you know, um, and apparently decided, yeah, you're in violation of your parole for not, you know, being at the uh, place you were required to be. So go back to jail. Just super fun. On November the 12th of 2016, Janie filed a pro se prisoner civil right complaint in federal court, naming Officer Games, Miss D Diaz de Leon, Carmack, and Constancy as defendants. The operative complaint was verified by Janney under penalty of perjury. It states four claims under 1983. He's suing for the 1983 violation, which are all brought against all the defendants. Claim one alleged Janney was falsely imprisoned when forced to stay at the mission. Claims two and three alleged Janney's placement in the program violated his First Amendment freedoms under the Establishment and Free Exercise Clause. Oh, that thing, yeah. And claim four alleged religious discrimination viol violation of equal protection. In a joint motion, Diaz de Lemon, Leon, mo voted moved to dismiss for lack of her personal participation, and Gomez moved to dismiss them for failure to state a claim. Janie objected only to the program defendants being dismissed from the claims of two and three. The district court sustained this objection, finding Janie had plausibly alleged the games and program defendants acted in concert to deprive him of his First Amendment rights. On October the 31st of 2019, Games and the program defendants each moved for summary judgment. Games argued he had not violated his rights under either of the religious clauses, and also he's entitled to qualified immunity. <laughs> the program's defendants argued they had not acted under color of law. Mr. Janey, still proceeding pro se, opposed these motions. He submitted a declaration and a supplemental declaration of supporting evidence, both sworn under penalty of perjury. He also submitted the Chronicle Parole Lodge, Officer Games Parole Directive and the Missions Literature. So, you know, supported evidence. So, you know, not doing too bad for a pro se. On February the 21st of 2020, the district court granted both summary judgment motions. The district court rejected the argument that program defendants were state actors, which is a prerequisite to liability, and then granted the qualified immunity claim. So the district court over here says these these otherwise private actors are still private actors. They were not acting under the government authority. And then said the officers have qualified immunity to the to the forced forcing people going to church services and Bible studies and and you know prayer services and things. This record over here just doing yeoman's work. Okay. All right, so let's discuss the standard now that we're on appeal. Summary judgment is appropriate if the movement shows there's no genuine dispute of fact, right? So if there's no dispute of fact, 
then you can judge the case. To oppose summary judgment, Janney put forward his own sworn statements in the form of two declarations. Also before the court were Janney's deposition and verified complaint, which may be treated as an affidavit on summary judgment. Defendants concede these materials create factual disputes, but assert the disputes are not genuine. Oh, okay, they're non-genuine disputes. All right. To serve as an appropriate vehicle to establish facts for summary judgment, an affidavit must set forth facts, not conclusionary statements. Moreover, the party opposing summary judgment must designate specific facts showing there's a genuine issue for trial. Did Janie do that? Parole officer Games over here argues Janie's evidence falls for, short of these standards, deeming it speculative. It's, it's speculation. His own declaration is speculation. It's speculation for him to say the things that he witnessed. It's speculation for him to say the things that he heard. It's speculation for him to refer to the program materials. Yeah. The district court characterized Janie's evidence similarly, finding the allegations that he was forced to participate in religious programming and refrain from discussing his atheist beliefs are conclusory and insufficient to raise a genuine issue of fact. Janie's testimony consists of more than mere legal conclusions, says the appellate court. Yeah, his statements are laden with specific facts relating to relevant transactions, dates, and persons. Based on his observation as a participating witness, Janie gave a detailed, detailed account of the events from February 3rd to the 9th, complete with descriptions of meetings, with the officer and the program defendants that include specific statements made by all three. Janie has thus carried his burden to portray factual disputes with specificity and particularity. Yeah, you know, that's not really speculative. That's not really um, conclusory. Here are the things they said. Here's what each person said. Here's what the program material said. Here's what happened. Those, those would be kind of facts. Uh... The district court somehow thought they were mere legal conclusions. The here is what they said. Here's what the material said. Those are those are legal conclusions. Oh, Michael says, I remember something about hearsay, but not sure. Ah, Michael, but this is not hearsay. It's very specifically not hearsay. We'll learn why later, but yeah. The program defendants claim that no competent record of evidence supports the con contentions. But Janie's contentions, his sworn statements, are themselves evidence. Yes, they are. Testimony, last time I checked, is evidence. So they are they are competent. Under the federal rules of evidence, every witness is presumed to be competent to testify unless they show they don't have personal knowledge. Well, how did I have personal knowledge? I was there, so yeah. The federal rules of civil procedure require affidavits or declarations used to oppose summary judgment, set out facts that would be admissible in evidence, and allow for objections on the basis that material cited to support a fact cannot be presented in a form that would be admissible. So if it's not evidence, then okay. So in this vein, the program defendants assert that Janney's evidence commits consists of inadmissible hearsay of Carmack, Constancy, and Officer Games that are offered for the truth of the matter asserted and argue that a reasonable jury could not return a verdict in favor of Janney solely on his baseless and insubstantial inadmissible allegations. So this is inadmissible hearsay. Uh-huh. Well, let me tell you why it's not. Mr. Janney's evidence does include out-of-court statements, at least some of which were offered for the truth. But because Carmack, Constanti, and Officer Gamez are all defendants, the statements Janey ascribes to each of them are statements of a party opponent. Under the federal rules of evidence, statements of a party opponent are excluded from being hearsay. Yeah, so this is a little quirk of the federal rules. It's not a hearsay exception like it is in every state court. It's not a hearsay exception. It's just simply not hearsay at all. It is not hearsay. It might be an out state. It might be an out of court statement offered for the truth of the matter asserted, but it's not hearsay because it came from a party opponent. The federal rules just define it that way. It's a little weird, but yeah, it is definitionally non-hearsay. Okay, yeah, I mean, that, that's easy enough. Janie's factual offers regarding what Carmack, 
Constanti and Gamus said to him, and what they heard said, a mouthful of admissible and competent evidence. It's admissible, yeah. Games and the program defectors, defect, this, is, this might be my favorite line in the entire thing. This might be my favorite line. Officer Gamus and the program defendants argue that Janie's evidence must be disregarded because it is self-serving. I, 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 this is my favorite argument because it's, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. You have, you should, you should ignore his, uh, declarations under oath because they're self-serving. Um, you know, not to put too fine a point on it, but I would imagine anything that you would say would also be self-serving, Right. One would imagine your testimony would be self-serving. So if, if, if his testimony should be excluded because it's self-serving, then all your testimony should be excluded for self-serving. Also, basically all testimony should always be excluded, you know, from any of the principles involved, you know, any of the principles involved. I guess we could still allow witnesses. We could still allow uh, other witnesses and we could still allow uh, expert evidence. But we would never have testimony ever again from either the plaintiff or defendant because, you know, it's self-serving. This is a strange rule of evidence. So long as an affidavit is based on personal knowledge and set forth facts that would be admissible, it's legally competent to oppose summary judgment irrespective of its self-serving. Because, yeah, the self-serving nature of sworn statements bears on credibility, not cognizability for the purpose of evidence. So, you know, the fact it's self-serving, like you can determine whether it's credible or not, but it's, it's evidence, you know, you can consider it. The program defendants further contend that Janney's factual account must be supported by evidence other than his own sworn statements. What? This argument too must fail. Janney's account does find support in independent record evidence. He, he does have evidence other than his sworn statements. Parole log entries support his assertions that a meeting took place between himself, Games, and Carmack in the office, and that this meeting Carmack requested Janie's curfew be changed to 4.30. Further, the mission literature listing mandatory 5 p.m. Cha chapel services for program participants supports Janie's assertion the curfew change was made for religious reasons. Janie attached both the parole log and the literature in his motion to oppose summary judgment. And that, and that Janie did not abscond from the mission, as Games claimed, but is instead expelled for not following religious rules, is supported by the defendant's own admissions. But even if it did stand alone, self-serving testimony can suffice to provide self-summary judgment. If all he had was his testimony, if it's a dispute of facts, it counts. To reject testimony because it's sub unsubstantiated and self-serving is to weigh the strength of the evidence or make a credibility determination tasks that belong to the trier of fact. They sure do. Notwithstanding the general summary judgment standard, when opposing parties tell two different stories, one of which is blatantly contradicted by the record, so no reasonable jury could believe it, a court should not adopt the facts for the purposes of this motion. So yes, there is an exception to believe everything the opposing side says. If what the opposing side says is blatantly contradicted by record evidence, then yeah. Seizing upon this exception, Games argues that various amounts of the contentions are blatantly contradicted by the record. So his factual contentions are blatantly rebutted. Uh-huh. I'm not. Yeah. No. Okay. In evidentiary case terms, this is a far cry from the exception promulgated by the law. There is no recording of the relevant conversation, nor any documentary evidence refuting the account. What little evidence there is contains other than parties' competing statements is inconclusive, and if anything, tends to validate the account as discussed above. In short, no evidence utterly discredits the version of statements. Yeah, I, I don't think so either. Janie claims he was coerced into participating in a Christian-oriented program as a mandatory condition of his parole in violation of the First Amendment. Oh yeah, that pusky thing. Mr. Janey is an atheist. Atheism is a school of thought that takes position on religion, the existence and importance of a supreme guilty, and a code of ethics, and thus, it is a belief system that is protected by the Free Exercise Clause. The Supreme Court has written the following. It, the Supreme Court has unambiguously concluded that individual freedom of conscience protected by the First Amendment embraces the right to select any religious faith or 
None at all. No belief is an option protected by the First Amendment. This conclusion derives support not only from the interest in respecting individual freedom of conscience, but also from the conviction that religious beliefs worthy of respect are a product of free and voluntary choice by the faithful, and from recognition of the fact that political interest in forestalling intolerance extends beyond intolerance among Christian sects or even intolerance among religions to encompass intolerance of the disbeliever and the uncertain. So, yes, atheists are in fact protected by the First Amendment. It is a belief system that is protected because, you know, we can't force religion on people. Yeah. The Establishment Clause means at least a state actor cannot force nor influence a person to go to or remain away from the church against his will or force him to profess a belief or disbelief of religion. No person can be punished for entertaining and professes, professing religious beliefs or disbeliefs for church attendance or non-attendance. The Supreme Court has repeatedly affirmed these core propositions. The Supreme Court writing, the state may not adopt program or practices which aid or oppose any religion. This prohibition is absolute. So, yeah. The district court did not reference Lee in analyzing Janey's establishment clause. Instead, it relied, relied on the test of Lemon versus Kurtzman. So they're going to go with the Lemon test. Okay. Under, le under Lemon, state action must satisfy three conditions to avoid violating the Establishment Clause. Okay. So under Lemon, state action has to satisfy these three things. Condition one, it must have a secular purpose. Fail. Its principal or primary effect must be one that neither advances nor inhibits religion fail. It must not foster an excessive government entanglement with religion. Fail. So I'm not sure, not really sure how the district court using the lemon test came to the opposite conclusion for all three of those things, but you know, okay. The district court exclusive focus on lemon was an error. Not that, you know, I think they should come to the same result anyway, but whatever. The Supreme Court has repeatedly emphasized an unwillingness to be confined to any single test or criterion in the sense of area of Establishment Clause jurisprudence. Thus, why Lemon remains a central framework is not the exclusive one. And claims of religious coercion, like the one presented here, are among those Lemon is ill-suited to resolve. I'm not sure why, because, again, my reading of Lemon would... yeah. Lee teaches, th this other case, Lee teaches a simpler common sense test should apply. Whether the government coerced anyone to support religion. It's, it's, about, it's about this time, it's about this time that I once again wish to offer my, uh, offer my availability to be a federal judge. You know, I, I think, you know, if this is the standard of federal judges, I think I can do better. I think... I think I can do better. You know, there's a lot, there's a lot that's ambiguous and unclear and mistakes can be made, but I'm not sure one of those mistakes is, is it okay for the government to force a person to go to church? I mean, I'm thinking, I'm thinking I would have gotten that one right. So just saying I'm available and I'd be better. I can do better than this. So, yeah. Applying the precedent three steps to these facts, Janie's evidence is sufficient to survive summary judgment on the Establishment Clause claims. The case law requires first step to ask whether the state has acted. Yeah. Here the state clearly sent Janie to the mission. Officer Gamez, representing Colorado in his position as a parole officer, directed Janie to establish his residence of record at the mission. The salient question, however, is whether the state also acted to place Janie in the mission's religious-oriented program as opposed to its secular overnight shelter. So apparently the mission does have a secular overnight shelter, shelter option. So that was available and would have been fine. But, you know, did they compel him to go to the religion? Janie argues that Gamez's written parole directive to abide by the mission's house rules as established show the state required him to participate in religious programming since the mission's only house rules were, program, were the program's religious-based rules. Defendant contended the reference to house rules was generic and did not maintain participation in any sort of religious programming. <laughs> okay, so even assuming the parole directive's reference to house rules did not equate to a state-mandated participation in the program, that inference can be drawn out by other facts. So, yeah, assuming that this didn't mean go to church, there's other facts. 
Per Jamie's declaration, Officer Game specifically arranged for Jamie's pro program participation with Carmack, who was game, who's Game's full friend and the mission director. Games also informed Jamie in the phone call that rules of the program were rules of his parole, including the religious ones. And the parole officer meeting later that day, Games told Janie he was going to follow the rules of the program while reiterating this meant participating in religious activities. So, yeah, I think, I think there might be enough involvement there. The second step asked whether this was coercive. Yeah. Janie avers that Games told him if he failed to follow the rules, including religious rules, his parole would be revoked and he'd be returned to jail. A choice between participating in religious programming or being sent to jail undeniably amounts to coercion. Yeah. Additionally, Games failed to provide Janie with any alternative residence options. Because Officer Games rejected Janie's proposed residence while directing him to stay at the mission, Janie was given a Hobson choice to violate his religious beliefs by following the program rules or return to jail. It was the state's responsibility, not Janie's to locate alternative residents that did not involve this coercive choice. The final step asks whether the object to coercion is religious or secular. Yeah. As a Christian faith-based community program, the program is more grounded in the overtly religious, such as o F F AA or NA, the non-denominational 12 steps programs who tends nonetheless violate the establishment clause. So yeah, I mean, you can have secular 12 step groups but when there's a re serious religious component, it, no. The district court concluded Janie cited no authority for the proposition that merely being compelled to attend his religious programming violated his rights. I'm going to read that again because I want everyone to make sure that we all got this, okay? Pay attention. The district court concluded Mr. Janie cited no authority for the proposition that merely being compelled to attend religious programming violated his rights. I don't know what to say, except I'd be a very good federal judge. I, I, think, I think I might be able to think of some authority that might suggest being compelled to engage in religious worship might be a problem. Yeah. It was also an error to assume that merely being compelled to attend religious programming as opposed to being forced to participate in the program cannot be sufficient to establish McClaw's violation. Okay, so the district court wants to go with the idea that we were only compelling you to be there. We weren't compelling you to actually participate. So that makes it totally okay. You're only forced to attend those religious services. Yeah. For purposes of protecting religious freedom guaranteed by the First Amendment, no distinction is drawn between coerced attendance and coerced participation, or between being forced to listen and being forced to convert. Under the Establishment Clause, the government can neither force nor influence a person to go to or remain away from a church against his will. Yeah. That is, the government violates the Constitution's religious freedom guarantee when it coerces attendance at religious events, regardless of whether the coercion extends to mandating complete participation or successfully achieves indoctrination. Put another way, because requiring the parolee to adopt religion or adopt any particular religion would be unconstitutional, it follows that requiring him to submit himself to a course advocating adoption also transgresses the First Amendment. Yeah. yeah. Mr. Janey's arguments sufficient to make out a free exercise violation based on such non-neutral coercion or compulsion. Janey was compelled to participate in the program's Christian worship services and Bible study to avoid being sent to jail and was proselytized by Karma during a one-on-one -on -one religious counseling session. These requirements indisputably burden Janey's exercise of religion. Y yeah. So as to whether or not this is clearly established so we can get past qualified immunity, which the district court apparently didn't have, a, the district court thought qualified immunity was totally cool. So in order to get past that, the appeals court writes, in February 2015, at the time of the events, a reasonable parole officer would have known that putting a parolee to the choice of participating in religious programming 
or returning to jail violates the Establishment Clause. So, yeah, this was kind of clearly established. By 2001, two circuit courts, at least three district courts, and two state supreme courts have all considered whether prisoners or parolee could be forced to attend religious-based treatment programs. This would be mostly in the context of AA or NA, where these cases are coming up, by the way. The courts have noted that there is a march of unanimity. So the courts all agree. You can't be forced to go to AA specifically. You might be able to force to you might be able to be forced to go to a treatment program. You might be even able to be forced to go to a 12 step treatment program, but not specifically AA because of its religious component. So if you stripped out all the religious components and made a secular version of AA, you might be able to for, be forced to go to that, but you know, not the not the religious one. Finding the case law on this issue uncommonly well settled because everyone agrees, the court held the law was clearly established sufficient to give notice. In the years since then, then the march of unanimity of finding participation, forced participation in religious programs violates the equal establishment clause has continued. Yet every court agrees. The First Circuit is determined by 2012 when the events in that case took place. Numerous courts have held requiring prisoners to attend a program that has religious component as condition for parole is unconstitutional. The Eighth Circuit holding the plaintiff had pled facts sufficient to state a claim that a parole stipulated requiring him to attend and complete substance abuse within a religious context in order to be eligible for parole violates the Establishment Clause. At both general and specific laws, the state law in February of 20, the state of the law in 2015 put an officer on notice that forcing Janney to a choice between participating in the commission's activities or violating parole was unconstitutional. At a general level, well before 2015, Supreme Court case law placed the issue beyond dispute. Establishment clause bars government from forcing anyone to support or participate in a religion or its exercise. Conduct aimed at religion that amounts to direct and tangible coercion, such as the parole officer's conduct, represents a pair paradigmic example of impermissible establishment of religion. Okay, so far we've talked about the state actors, the parole officer, but the person sued a whole bunch of private actors, right? The head of the mission, the program director, and so forth and so on. So we've sued a bunch of private actors under 1983. Now, 1983, as you probably know, requires someone to act under color of law. So the idea of suing a private person under 1983 is a little strange, except, of course, where the private person is so intertwined with the government, they basically become a government actor for the purposes of whatever they're doing. So a private person can become a government actor. So is this a situation where that happened? Let's discuss. When a constitutional claim is asserted against private parties to be classified as state actors under color of law, they must be jointly engaged with state officials in the conduct allegedly violating the federal right. Under the joint action test, courts examine whether state officials and private parties have acted in concert in effecting a particular deprivation of rights. This test is satisfied by establishing the private party is a willful participant in a joint action. One way to prove willful joint action is to demonstrate the public and private actors engaged in a conspiracy. The district court found Janie had not adduced any evidence to show they acted in concert. Really? Really, district court? You couldn't find any evidence that the parole officer and the mission were acting in concert with each other. Couldn't find any evidence to support that proposition. Why am I not a federal judge? I, I don't know. Okay. The record suggests Games and Carmack agreed to work together to achieve the shared goal. The requisite meeting of the minds can be placed found in a phone call between Carmack and Games on the morning of February 4th in addition to meeting that afternoon. During the meeting over Janie's objection, Games and Carmack verified their agreement about Janie's stay to the mission. To avoid returning to jail on parole violation, Janie had to obey mission house rules, which Carmack reiterated meant participating in the program's religious activities. From these facts, a jury could find Carmack was a willful participant with the officer. Yeah, I mean, of course. The record establishes that the state, through officer games, has significantly greater input regarding the challenge conduct than in other cases where we didn't find state action. During two occasions on February 4th, Games and Carmack conferred about Janie's objection to the program, then both expressly told Janie the rules of the program were rules of his parole, including the religious rules, and he could either abide by them or return to jail. Far from staying silent or acquiescing, with the conduct like otherwise occurred, Games took an active role 
in collaborating with Carmack to ensure Jane's adherence to the program. Based on Jane's factual account, a jury could infer Games did not merely approve of the program's religious conduct after the fact, but instead directed it to, to occur. So, yeah, it wasn't merely passive. It, he was an active participant, if you buy Jane's story. Which, you know, sounds plausible since they all were meeting in the pro office and there's record of that, so yeah. Thus, that brings us to the end of the discussion of the case on Mark Janney versus John Gomez. In this case, Mark Janney was a parolee. And Officer Gamez over here, his parole officer said, attend church, read the Bible, engage in prayer. If you don't, your parole will be revoked. And the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals says, yeah, I seem to remember something about a First Amendment. I'm not quite sure how you, the officer missed it, or the parole board missed it, or for that matter, the district court missed it, but you know, it, it's there. And so, yeah, if you accept the premise, at what Janie said is true, he has a cause of action. And there does seem to be evidence to support that proposition, including admissions from the other side, and documentation, and logs of meetings, and so forth and so on. So, yeah. So go back to trial, figure out if this stuff happened, or damages, at least for the moment. That brings us to the end of the discussion of this case. Thank you so much for being part of the Uncivil Law family. If you enjoyed this legal education content, please hit the subscribe button. It really helps the channel grow. We appreciate your continuing support. Until later, my friends, cheers and goodbye.